was still in control of the universe. This was, this was something that was very powerful, you see? So we have to do that. I, I'm just giving you just a short uh, introduction of our speaker and then uh, I, will, I will take my seat. We are delighted. In fact, I am uh, very, very honored to have this brother. This is Brother Nubentud Kaliya. He's a brother from Sudan uh, who has done deep study of the ancient languages of Africa. Uh, brother knows several languages. Uh, and he not only knows several languages, but he has been a student of the Nobin language for a long time. Uh, he is um, absolutely uh, uh, one of the people that we uh, promote his work. We, we honor his work. He's taught at the uh, Georgetown University, uh, helping uh, in the Department of Linguistics. Uh, the brother is uh, one of the major consultants on the Nobin language. Sometimes we talk as if uh, the only language of Africa is uh, Metunetche, is uh, Chikam, the language of Kemet. But no, there are 3,000, more than 3,000 languages in Africa. Africa is the continent of most languages. I mean, more languages in Africa than any other continent, to put it that way. There's a lot of, lot of languages in Africa. And, but one of the uh, languages that is uh, most important for us is the Nobin language. And I'm just delighted that uh, uh, Brother uh, uh, Kalia, Brother Nubin Tud, and Nubin Tud is a powerful name, meaning basically the son of Nubi. This brother is uh, here with us today. We're delighted. Uh, we honor him uh, as a leader of the Nubian Language Society. Uh, which is affiliated uh, with the Maleficati Asante Institute. We'd like to have Brother Nubin too. Brother Nubin too, please come. Uh, first of all, let me greet you in our African way. Maskab Jiro. And this means, do you keep goodness? I don't know how to express myself as a youngest young uh, African uh, from from the continent who have been really blessed and honored to be in Molefi Asante Institute. Molefi Asante for us is a big name and it's a big hope for all for many African uh, revolutionists and many African who are putting a lot of hope today on uh, countries like Sudan to make a big change and to restore back itself. Uh, Molefi Asante is our prophet and our, our philosopher. So uh, on behalf of my community and many youngs of Africa, I send uh, their greetings and their big thank for your great work you have done and you have paved the way for us and for many generations to come. I really feel privileged and honored today to be here to give a humble talk about, uh, an introductory talk about our culture. One of uh, the endangered languages and one of the forgotten cultures uh, worldwide. Uh, so, Yes. Okay. So, Maskar Jiro again. And this means, do you keep the spirit of goodness? Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think this is a religious greeting. And uh, maybe, maybe it has had to do also with the influence of the Kemetic uh, culture, the the culture of Ka, and Mas means good, and then Ka. Maskarjilo, do you keep do you keep the good spirit of goodness? So, I wish you all to have the spirit of goodness and the spirit of our forefathers uh, of Nubia, and we say in Nubin, Nubal, 
Tochi Minno means welcome to Nubia. Uh, and as you see, one of our grandfather here is just opening the door and welcoming you all, brothers, because Nubia belongs to Africa. And Africa is one. And Africa is one. And Africa has many faces and has many cultures, but in essence, they are one. Uh, let me start with a shocking information and let me start with a sad speech. Uh, sorry, Professor Molefe Asanti, in spite of people like you and in spite of uh, uh, many scholars of today, Africa and Africans have been deprived of using their own language because of, you know, the colonization and slavery and cultural hegemony and many and many inside not only outside the continent also inside the continent and it is very sad that you can only see now few few countries in the continent maybe none is using their own language in their own what they call it the countries or this post-colonial states. There is no single African language nowadays uh, recognized as international language in the list of their languages. You can name it, you can see the Chinese, the Mandarin, the English, the French, the Italian, the Spanish, all this. But us, we are not represented. In spite of this big minds like Molefe, John, Jack, uh, Sheikh Antediouk, or Emin Hotop even in the past, our big, big contribution and our big civilizations, we are not there, Professor. We are sorry to say that. And you can see now, we only exist, we only struggle to exist in the shadow of the world either here or even in the country. And I'm telling you from a real experience. That my country has more than 200 life languages. None of them have ever been recognized as a language in Sudan. This is the same case in Kenya, same case in Tanzania. You go wherever you go, we have been, uh, ha, ha, we have been, in, been enforced to speak our colonizers' tongues mm -hmm. and to deal with it as a fact. Mm -hmm. In Sudan, we have been dealt to be like an uh, a, a Arabic, an Arabic has, mm -hmm. came to us uh, as a foreign language, mm -hmm. and then came the English. Mm -hmm. uh, our neighbor in Chad, they speak French. Mm -hmm. Uh, our neighbor in, in the south, mm -hmm. they speak English, mm -hmm. like in Uganda and mm -hmm. Kenya. In spite of this, you know, multicultural and diverse and rich uh, languages, we are not there. Africa has many, as you know, has many languages, and as Professor Molefe have just mentioned. And we are actually the birth continent of maybe most of the lang of the language families of what they call it the language phylums mm -hmm. uh, the nilo saharan the niger congo a uh, you can just name it the all of this has no way to see the life in the in the list of the international uh, languages and what i mean by this uh, we are not there in the, in the trade, mm -hmm. in the education, mm -hmm. in the novel, in the arts, in technology. We are not there. And once we are not there, that means the African mind has been subdued. It's not presented mm -hmm. because the language is a big, big tool for 
the human community. And uh, therefore, uh, as I'm here in Bolefi Asante Institute, I think because, because of all of this and many reasons, I, I think there is a need now to establish what we call it a pre-colonial studies. Many indigenous African languages have been endangered today, as you see in this list. All these languages of, of Africa are endangered, most of them. They will not live uh, in, the, in the next 50 years. Um, because of the dominant spread of uh, the foreign tongues and like Arabic, English, French, and other European languages. This lingual colonization prevent Africa to understand itself and to find its own version of development. You only have one way being imposed to us, the Western way or other ways, but they always speak about Africa is lacking behind, uh, Africa is not developed, Africa the, one of the essence, one of the major, uh, uh, as I think, as I believe, one of the major reasons may be because Africa is still colonized, lingually, culturally, and and this lingual colonization actually prevent Africa from understanding and go back to itself, and. Uh, by, by saying that, I mean based on its own cultural values, cultural perceptions, because the language can make this, uh, this uh, transfer, this, they will take us back there. Uh, there were there, there before the, clon clonaliz the colonization. Sorry, English is my third language. It's not my even first or second. So please <laughs> forgive me. Uh, for, so there is a colonial gap. This colonial gap between Africa, the, the real Africa, and us, the Africans of today. Because our African perception have been based, and values of today have been based on the colonial values, or other people's value, other people's vision on us. Do you imagine that countries like Sudan, their name even being given to them by other people? Like Congo is an African name, but Cameroon is a French guy, a French missionary. Now we have people, we call them Cameroonians. Mm or Sudanese, <laughs> those are not us, this is other people, they tell us you now, you are like this, so because of this colonial gap, we cannot go back to ourselves, so the first thing we need to establish connection with our ancient Africa and gain back our sovereign sovereignty as black people in the continent or wherever we are is to cross this colonial gap and dismantle it. We've heard about post-colonial studies. It's actually was more concerned of criticizing, more critics to colonialism, to imperialism, but it is highly time now to stay just on the critical level. We have to go further. And when we say go further, we need to establish a new school that dismantled colonization forever. And I think this aligned with your call, Professor, on the Afrocentric uh, paradigm. And I think we have to, um, you as a scholars and you as our elders and prof, now it's also with you here, mm -hmm. so maybe you can start this school, <coughs> the pre-colonial studies of Africa.
so can allow for us as a young generation to cross this gap and uh, align ourselves with our real vision as Africans and gain the true knowledge, not the colonial knowledge. Because all the terms now have been defined by people, like even when we study archaeology, history, language, we studied through other other people too, who have been colonized us and have been enforced different knowledge on us to be accepted as the fact. Um, and it's of course it's away from us and away from our original perceptions. So we have to redefine ourselves by gaining this power, by crossing this colonial gap. One of the strongest tools, I believe, will be the language. The languages of Africa, the living language of Africa today, can make us cross this gap. It's a very powerful tool, and I'm, what I'm going here, I'm just going to give you more examples of how the language bursts those perceptions and values that can bring us and bring this African mind away from the colonial mind. And uh, I know this is a big claim, and I'm a young <laughs> uh, scholar, but I'm trying to be a good student. <laughs> um, so our language is our identity. Tameluni Naigiduna. This was actually the motto that we used uh, like say 15 years ago when we started the Nubian Language Society when we were young in Sudan. It was during uh, the peace agreement who, which was signed between the South and the North and Dr. John Gallen came with this new Sudan vision mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and during that time uh, actually at the, day, the same day John Gallen came to Khartoum we established the Nubian Language Society. Mm -hmm. Because it was the only time for the Sudanese to be allowed to speak about their African identities mm -hmm. because of the new constitution. Mm -hmm. They call it the interim constitution of New Sudan. And for us, at that time, as young Nubian youth, was a big thing. But when we come back after many years, and I think of it, I think that was right. Because our language is our identity. Because it, it bears our unique cultural genes. Uh, the whole world of things can be represented by language. And this was the call of the many philosophers. The language is the first production of any human society. Look at the Africans. They have been deprived to represent themselves and use their first production. Um, and it's the accumulation of knowledge and perceptions and values, you name it, and vision. Uh, our language is a symbolic signifier of collective identity for any country. And my big claim for many African uh, states of today, yet they have gained their political independence from their colonizers. But because of, they still, under the cultural uh, hegemony and cultural colonization, yet their independence, independence or the state of being independent uh, countries or independent nations is not being fulfilled yet because they are intellectually, mentally, lingually using other people's uh, representation and other people's notion because of the language. And given that one community has gained its political independence, it doesn't mean that they are yet independent because they still rely on other people's language, other people perceptions, other people values. Um, Nubia, uh, as a land of ancient uh, uh, civilization, uh, as Professor Molefi said, 700 BC, uh, there was a Kushite Empire, 
the Nubian were known with the time of the Kandasis or the Kandakas, uh, the rule of women, uh, great civilization of karma. So this land now is Sudan. Before, when Africa was aligned by itself, lived in its own uh, independence, they flourished. Now, country like Sudan, can you imagine a country started this civilization, all this region, when I talk about Kush, I talk about Sudan, Chad, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, all these countries now are suffering. They are, even they are not classified as uh, underdeveloped countries. Why? 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 Because of so many things, maybe the loss of ident cultural identity is one of the main reasons, uh, especially in the case of Sudan. Uh, Nubia was the birth of historical writing system. Uh, this is the uh, ancient historical writing system. And uh, then later came the Merwetic. The Merwetic during the time of Merwi civilization was an abjad writing system. Uh, doesn't like a consonant base, does not have vowels like English. And it was somehow survived for say 600 years or so until it was disappeared during, as some historian claim, the, the, when the Aksumites came to Merawi and destroyed their capital. Um, the Old Nubian, also another script which was developed based uh, during the Christian time was developed uh, based on the Greek, the Orthodox, they used Greek alphabets, and then they modified with some Merwetic symbols, and also they used uh, some uh, Coptic, I believe also coming from the, the Shai and Hori, some three sample, uh, symbols or characters from, from ancient Egypt through the Coptic, language. So it was also, uh, this actually lasted for more than 1,000 years. So the writing of Nubia with this script. And then gone after the invasion of the Arabs or the Muslims when they conquered uh, the capital of Dongola during the, third, the 14th century. Uh, so I'm going to speak today in my example of the language about Nubin. Nubin, uh, the tongue of the Nile Nubian of today, uh, three groups, the Mahas, Sukkot, Halfa, and also spoken in, in the south of Egypt. Uh, the word Nubin itself is a genitive word derived from Nobi, and the singular is Nob. A nob means the black denizen or the black inhabitant of Nile of the Nile River. And he described himself as Nob. So in the language I say I Nobamil means I am a black inhabitant. Mm -hmm. And then he described his language as Nobi, something belongs to this black uh, person. Maybe you heard that some people interpret that as the gold or mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with gold. <laughs> Nobin comes from Nob, and Nob means the black inhabitant of the night, mm. uh, of lower Nubia. Mm. And in this sense, you can consider the language as the language of the black people. Mm -hmm. So that was the original. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is how mm -hmm. the story started with this language. And this language, uh, spoken as you see here in the map, it means here, South and, and North Sudan, mm -hmm. and it bears the name of the black. The people call the black name Nob. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Nobin, in fact, has connection with other languages all over 
the region. We have Nubians in Darfur, <coughs> most they call the Middle. We have people in the south that are called the Birgit. We have Nubians in the center of Sudan, in, a, 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 in an area called Nuba Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And all these Nubian towns, mm -hmm. because also there is one thing, uh, in the Western model of civilization and culture, we have a centralized mm -hmm. model. This is not the case in Africa, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, we are so decentralized and diverse that you cannot see one version. You should, in the, if you want to study Africa, you have to accept that Africa is so diverse. And from the beginning, it is based on decentralization. So, Nubian is one of the Nubian tongues. With itself, also, it has some di dialects, mm -hmm. at least two major dialects. And uh, now some Scholars, they call it by the dialectal names, Mahas uh, and Fadija. And they think those, is, those are tribal names. We, those are not tribes. They're just areas. Mahas is an area, and Fadija is an area, and those are dialects. Um, so, the Nubian family, belongs to a big family in Africa called the Nile Sahara. And the Nile Sahara actually spread all over the continent. We have Nile Sahara languages in Sudan, in Ethiopia, in Mali, in, uh, in, in, in the West Africa, we have Nile, we have Nile Sahara in Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, even in Eritrea, we have the Nara. So it's one of the big families of languages and we have still we're still skeptical about this classification as you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. because it's not done by us that's right all this knowledge is not that's us right. we're still using it and we have a lot of you know we have a lot of doubt about it but even we just have to deal with it as a fact now but we're waiting for a, 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 this big break of this you know change. Um, so within the Nile of Sahara, they classify Nubin as a northeastern Sudanic. And one of the uh, uh, Western scholars, uh, he insisted to have like the Merwetic. And the Merwetic, uh, maybe he's the only one who thinks that the Merwetic belongs to this group. And uh, the Nubin, as I've mentioned, has sisters all over the region. Mm -hmm. And those, because what I've explained, the uh, diversity, we don't, we, could, we cannot have one, one uh, shape of uh, the culture. The culture in Africa has many shapes, very diverse culture, based on multiculturalism. It's just, uh, inherently, it's, it's something uh, uh, by nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nobin has connection with the Merwetic, um, according to Claude Rivi, one of the French scholars. And uh, I did some comparison, actually, to verify that. And I, and I found something very interesting. I just took some of the keywords in Merwetic and I compared it to Nobin. Uh, some of them are kinship terms, like family words basic verbs, uh, figurative words, like kind of a cocktail words from different semantic domains. And it's actually I found some lexical um, connection. And not only that, I also looked at the Merowetic uh, description of phonology today as we have <laughs> dealt with it from and look what they have done in the Merowetic. According to their description, Merowetic has 23 sounds, and the Merowetic language does not have the two fricative voice sounds, and the v, and this is actually the same case in Nobin. And maybe Nobin, one of the closest now, 
living uh, town to the Meravatik. Not only the old Nubian, but also to the Meravatik. And this brings uh, another importance to this language. And the problem with this language, as we will see um, later, it is endangered. It's not going to live unless we African going to work on that. Nubian also has connection with the Nilotic language. And when I say Nilotic language, I speak about the Nilotic language of the region from South Sudan all over to Uganda, Kenya, and so on, Maasai. And I just, there is, a, there is a scholar who did comparison with Old Nubian, with Shuluk, Nwur, Denka, and Bari. I did the same thing with Nubian, mm -hmm. with only the five numerals. Like the number one, two, three, four, five, the word of one or two, three, and uh, I find also amazing things, which is kind of uh, because of my lack of knowledge onto the Nilotic languages. But maybe this is an experiment, or on the NLS, uh, one day we have to do like this type of comparison and see if we can find uh, more, more connection. And the problem is, this Nubin is a tongue spoken in North Sudan. And, and Shuluk, Nuer, and Denka, and Bari are languages of South Sudan. Imagine how we are being isolated to link ourselves. If these people from the beginning, they have found deep connection between the North and the South, mm -hmm. there, was, there would not be a problem. These people have been fighting for many years until the South got independent. The South of Sudan now is an independent country. Imagine how, because of the isolation of, 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 uh, of because of the colonial isolation of how of Sudan as adopting the Arabization and adopting other things. So uh, we couldn't find a vision of real unity between South mm -hmm. and North Sudan while they are so connected from the beginning and because of the language loss. Uh, Nubin, with its also uh, sisters, uh, the Dunglawi or the Andandi in North, Karku is a tongue in, uh, in Nuga Mountain uh, in the west of uh, Dalinj, it's spoken also by a group of Nubians, and De and Tegli also, and Midot is a tongue of a Nubian of Darfur. Uh, what I want to show you here in this uh, table, how these uh, languages are so symmetrical. Uh, uh, in this column, you see this is the subject, I corresponds to the first person in English. In the second column, this is the word water as an object. And this, in the last column, this is the verb. So all these languages follow the same uh, grammatical system, subject, verb, object. Not only this, the object is always marked this is one of the characters in, in the Nubian languages and maybe in the, some of the Nadu Saharan, especially in Northeastern Sudanic mm -hmm. languages. Uh, all of them, they take, they mark the object. Not only this, they use the same marker. They use the same marker to mark the object. When I say mark the object, uh, to explain for other people who are not familiar with what I'm saying, we, in English, we mark the plural, right? We put S to say this is a plural. We say boy, boys, the S is just you mark. This you point out, this is a plural uh, word. So the same thing here in Nubi, because we don't have that in English, but in Nubi, in Dungulawi, in Karku, Tegli, all this language, they mark. And this is the ancestral language for them, the old Nubian. It has the same feature. Uh, the verb are almost identical. So you will be saying that maybe this language because they live together. In fact, this is not the case. They are so isolated geographically. 
and they're so isolated politically, but they kept the same, same structure and the same nature. And, uh, and, and this will lead us also to do a lot of uh, comparison in the anthropological uh, life of these groups. But can you imagine this because of Sudan is adopting a different culture. All this group are not unified. They think they are different. They think they are not together. You see, when we adopt a false identity, we corrupt ourselves. We destroy ourselves. We are brothers, all of us, but because we adopting a false identity. And this is actually, the language can play this key role in doing that. Uh, the status of Nubian language of today is sad, because according to the statistic of some Europeans, we have uh, less than 700,000 people speaking it in 1996. We expect a degradation of, let's say, 10,000 every year, because the elders die, and when the elders die, the language die ground. So now we are trying to preserve the language and even to teach it to all the Africans. And uh, by the way, I always ask, maybe through Molefe Asante Institute, uh, you can always have an access to, to study this language. And you can have all the knowledge for free. And all what you have to do, you have just to attend the online classes mm -hmm. and register yourself. Um, but Nobin is under great threat of extinction. Not only Nobin, all these languages I'm telling you about. Not only this, all these languages. All the languages of Darfur, all the language of Uganda, Kenya, I've talked to many Africans. It's the same sad story. We are losing ourselves. The death of a la an African language means the death of our African story, our African narrative, our African philosophy, our African perceptions. So uh, that's a big loss. Um, uh, Nubin as a gender langu genderless language, and by the way, uh, when you type genderless language in Google, you will see Mandarin, Chinese, maybe Norwegian or whatever, <laughs> but you will never see a single African language. You know how many genderless languages in Africa? The concept of genderless, as you will, started from the continent. The prof just said it now here. But we are not there. <laughs> not even in the Google search. <laughs> yeah. So, Nubin, like many other African languages, we have this concept of no gender. No gender means we have, in, in the case of the third person, the third person in English, he, it could be she, like because of the gender, or it could be it because of the gender, right? So there is a distinction between man itself, within itself, man and woman, and then a distinction between man and other things. Now, the case in Africa, no. The case, the, we have only one pronoun. So man is united by itself. There is no difference between man and woman. Man is united with the nature. Mm -hmm. And this represents a perception, a big perception. People who are calling now for egalitarianism and this you know, equality, it is already embedded in the culture. <laughs> the perception is already there, started thousands and thousands of years. The African mind have created this. Mm -hmm. And, and Africa was the birth of all these ideas, even long time ago, long time ago. It is not something just started now by the Western culture. <laughs> um, the, so the human component of the language, this is one an example, like how uh, if you go to the temple of uh, Abadamak in the desert of Nubia in northern Sudan, and and the, the term is called the Masawarat or Musawarat. Mm -hmm. um, this is in North Sudan, and you go to the temple, and I, I, 
I couldn't understand this unless I go, went back to the depths with the language. Uh, there is, in the temple, they put everything, like the crocodiles, mm -hmm. all the nature, the animals, everything. And they put the human at the very low. Mm -hmm. So that means the human here is so unified and so humble, with all, not only with itself, with all the, all the, uh, all the animals, all, all the objects, mm -hmm. just unified with the nation. That's why our civilization, this is what I believe, it's maybe a big claim. Here we have our, I'm st still a student, we have our professor, can correct me. I think because of that, the African civilization didn't make any destroy in the environment. Because they believe that the environment is equal to them. They have the right to protect it. It was not harmful to the environment. It didn't bring nuclear weapons or this crazy you know, weapons or destructive ideas. Um, Nubin also conveys historical perception of the Nile. Look at this proverb. And I'm going to read you with, from the language and explain. Eget Eget Denjam, Fat Feget Denjam. This means the sheep with the sheep gathers, and the goat with the goats gather. And for scholars and students of the, the Nile Valley mm -hmm. civilization, you will always go to the, what is the, what is the symbol of the sheep in, in, in the ancient culture? Uh, actually, the god Amundra, mm -hmm was depicted all the time in the form of a sheep and represented as a source of goodness. And uh, in Tibas or in North Sudan or, or whatever you go to the temple you see God Amun always have the form or the picture of or the statue of sheep. And this proverb in this culture actually uh, appears like a signifier, like tell us all here just remind us, because what does it mean, this proverb in the language, that the sheep is a symbol for the good people, and the goat is a symbol for the bad people. <laughs> so here, this comes from the Amun Ra uh, uh, concept, and this mythological representation of the sheep was adopted later by Christianity. And now when you speak about this, everybody will think, oh, this is a Christian or biblical. But this, actually, those languages of today, and maybe if you can find more and more in Africa, if we dig deep more, we'll find those proofs that tells, no, it was not a Christian idea. But even the Christian idea, when they came back, they say the shepherd and sheep. So you have to have a shepherd. But here, because of the human is, is united with the nature, with all the components of nature. The sheep was the sheep. We don't need a shepherd. <laughs> we don't need somebody to control. <laughs> so the Christianity, they adopted the idea and they, 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 they twitch, twix it, or what they call it in, in English. So now, another example from the language. Eh? Sorry, I only know no being. But I'm sure all the examples could be found in, at, in all these Nubian languages and in all these many African languages. Uh, uh, Nubian conveys many signs of materialistic culture. That's a big claim. But when we go in depth with, the, with analyzing the language structure, we found that uh, the word Ain, which means the mother, and this is very interesting for you guys. Maybe Dr. Na, I have a big claim here. Maybe <laughs> if we say, approve it or we say this is crazy guy. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, uh, I will continue. Uh, uh, I will have the brave food <laughs> stand and say it. <laughs> this big, big, big claims. So, uh, it conveys materialistic aspects. Because um, in the word Ain, um, actually, the trace of the word Ain in the, in, the, in the language structure 
help us to discover that these people, their perception about women, and it is very different than any other thing. And me, and this, uh, I think, talk to some scholars, they say they have the same case in other African languages. Um, maternalism means motherhood in Nubia. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I mean by maternalism, it simply means the state of being a mother, or the motherhood. So the word ain in common uh, in all Nubian languages. We have Ain in the Old Nubian, it's the same word, means the mother. We have Ain in the Nile Nubians, or Nubian and, and the other languages, it's the same word, means the mother. We have Ain in Hell Nubians, it's the same word, means the mother, the Birgit also, and the Darfurians Nubians. So the word Ain appears generally in genetic constructions, attached to the noun. And it appears in kinship in family words, it appears in animate nouns, it appears in inanimate nouns. Inanimate means subjects, something not living. In a living noun, something, a noun that, or a word that represents a living thing and a non-living thing. Um, let's take the case of the family words. The family word uh, important in no being you see the structure of Ain in Ainness, means maternal aunt, and also the brother. The brother is called the son of the mother, and the sister of the mother, the aunt. And the father, even the father has, uh, the, the uncle has also, even if it's paternal, Ain should come in, in between. So Ain actually constitutes the const or constructs the family relations defines the family, the word of the family relations, and Ains. Remember, Ains means mother. So you have to have the word mother in most of the basic family words in order to define. If I want to define a brother, it's the son of the mother. <laughs> so, and then very interesting. We have the man itself. How do you call the man in this language? We call him Idain. It means man. Uh, sorry, how you call the, the woman? We call her Idain. It means a man, and then Ain means... So the, the woman is called the mother of the man. The woman is called the mother of the man. So the woman is not only constructing the family relation, or linking the family, or defining the family relation, but also defining the status of being a man. So the man called the woman the mother of the man, Irene. And it also means human in some, like you say here, man, you know, the same thing, the same status in, in, the, in, in, the, in the language. Mm -hmm. So. So the aim, the word aim means could be the mother of the human. And this is actually the definition or how this community uh, sees or, or defines the woman. It's the mother. Even if it is only five or two years old, it is still considered a mother in the eyes of everyone. And from here came a big conception. Like the woman is so holified and sacred mm -hmm. because it is a mother or will become a mother of someone. And maybe this is this maternalistic view or perception is so different than a woman being a female or a feminine right. or a feministic way. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at the animate or the living objects. Living objects, we see, i um, giving you an example here uh, from the donkey. We called, we have something called the mother donkey. So the mother donkey is actually, uh, uh, in this example, Kachumale, Kajnenaton, Kachisa means all the donkeys came from the mother donkey. So always we think there is a mother of something that 
was the source of this thing. So if Ain, Idain is a source of a man, so Kajnain is a source of uh, the catch, which is a donkey. So we always have mm -hmm. this concept mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. extended, not only with a human, mm -hmm. extended with other things. Mm -hmm. And Egednain, also the, the mother of the sheep. Mm -hmm. And not only with the animals, mm -hmm. it's also with other like uh, plants. Mm -hmm. We have something called Fantinane, if you see this in the north, we call it Fantinane. And Fantinane, Fanti means the palm tree. And then when you add Ain means the mother palm tree. Mm -hmm. And this has actually three together. Mm -hmm. And and powerful thing about this, it doesn't need a, like a male palm tree. Mm -hmm. It can reproduce by itself. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the conceptions for the Nubian to accept Christianity. Mm -hmm. They they been explained to them, Christ had been uh, uh, given mm -hmm. by the yes by 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 the Mary mm -hmm. the Virgin just like the Fantine just like the mother palm tree they doesn't need a man mm -hmm. and so you see here aim is a perception mm -hmm. is a concept mm -hmm. going to the not only the living thing even the non-living thing mm -hmm. we have the definite which is the mother the fufa remember the fufa mm -hmm. in Kerma. And Kerma is a civilization in North and Sudan, earlier to Nabata. And they have a famous uh, ruins and famous uh, place uh, in Kerma now called the Fufa. Some of the people, they, clear, so they call it the Fufa Diffine, means the mother uh, city or the mother castle. So you have this concept of the mother being used extensively within the language to refer to the source. Sometimes Ain means the source, not just the mother. And Martine is the mother uh, runlet or the mother canal mm -hmm. and so on. So, um, so to keep my word short and my speech short, Ain was a source of morals in ancient Nubia. Uh, this is a big claim. Uh, if we uh, take, uh, for instance, um, the time of Kerma, um, we know little, but we know there are some priestess. So those women priests, when, and because uh, the appearance of those women priests in Kermites' uh, temples was so vivid. But in Nabata, and in the Kushite, and Meroe, and in the Kushite time, speaking about Nabata and the uh, 25th dynasty, you talked about Bayanti or Bayanti or Baya, or mm -hmm. yeah, some people they call him Baya. Mm -hmm. So this guy, because we know, because of the colonial, you know, mm -hmm. perception, they think of the male. Mm -hmm. But do you know that, guys, the Baya? by all his greatness, and Shaptako, and Taharko, and those people were nothing without their mothers. They have, if they want to be crowned, they have to come with their mothers to be accepted by the people. Not only that, they have to have connection with something they call the, the house mother of the, the, the wife of Amuns. And, uh, for instance, let's say, let's say Baya. Baya himself was connected with many women. From one of them, Abar, mm -hmm. Tabiri, mm -hmm. uh, Nifrukasta. Mm -hmm. All these women are so powerful. So during, uh, because of the concept of the aim, mm -hmm. during this time actually, the authority in the temple was more higher than the political authority. Right, right. And do you know that only women have the way to the ascendancy of the highest? Because the, the, the wife of Amun, Ra, this is like even uh, higher than the king or the emperor or the 
or the bride himself, because she was the interceder between the gods and the people. Even the king himself to come to her to ask her <laughs> to intercede. No king in Africa cannot be crowned without his mother mm -hmm. or his wife. Mm -hmm. The wife and the mother are more important than him. We don't have this chapter in the history about the women because we're still using <laughs> other people's definitions and other people's knowledge. Um, the same thing with the time of Merwi. We have the Candaces, the Kandakas, the Kandaka, the mother queen. They were the rulers. They were the, the, the head of the army. Can you name me any woman now in our world to be the head of the army, rule the, any army? Can you just name me one? I can name you five of them, at least. So during the Christian time, even with the influence of Greek, was still Africa was still kind of ha have its own way. Uh, we have a very interesting message from a king, a Christian king in Nubia, who had been uh, uh, under attack by the Muslim Arabs uh, during the Fatimid. I think his name was George, and these people came and they took uh, the daughters and the wife. And they went back to Al Fustat, which is Cairo now. And he wrote back to the to the Muslim rule. To the Muslim ruler or the Muslim whatever you call him. And he asked him to return back the family, especially the wife. And he told him in the message very interesting information. You guys can rule without your women because you can just substitute mm -hmm. it. But we Nubians, or we Africans, I cannot be a king without my queen. Mm. So that was a statement powerful that we know that that time how important was the role of the woman. It was not just a background. It was the whole thing. So um, we have this woman here. I, know I don't want to take the much of the time. Mm. We have this woman here, Anna. This woman, nobody knows, uh, many people don't know about her. One of the saints of the Christian time. And uh, this woman maybe was the first to start something called voluntary work. Or the, what later, what they call the Red Cross or those mm -hmm. NGOs and non profit. Mm -hmm. She submitted her, herself the children and she started this charity that was in the, in the sixth or seventh uh, century way long then any time <laughs> yeah and this is Hatur mm -hmm. and Isis and Israel. the woman was aim maybe because who she was brought in the sample in the sim in, in, in the form of Hatur and Isis mm -hmm. that's why the community look at her as a sacred source. Uh, Ain is the source of mind and knowledge and creativity. There was no doubt about it. All this invention of uh, farming, tools, domestic tool, the pottery of karma, all this beautiful decoration, and the civilization started with women. Uh, in Wada Hafa, we still use Hafsa women they doing the decoration in the Nubian area. Sadly, now, as you know, the story of Wada Hafa has been uh, drowned uh, by the, by, yeah, by Nasser. <laughs> lake. Yeah, the lake. So, woman was a source of power, as I've mentioned. And uh, you see, this is very interesting picture when I looked at it in the archaeology, uh, a woman handed the power to the woman. It's actually because of that the woman is so important. This is the queen of the king and this is the, the Holy Mary. Maybe during that time the replace of Hatur or this woman here, Hatur and Isis, 
they came in the form. They accepted this because when you look at the Nubian Christianity, it was very materialistic. They only deal with Mary. They don't care about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they think of the women. So maybe that's what that's the way they accepted Christianity. I mm -hmm. see a lot. Mm -hmm. This is the Kanafa, the warrior, mm -hmm. the fighter, the queen, mm -hmm. everything. All the titles. Um, just I will end my talk. Sorry mm -hmm. I talk too much. Um, it's a comparison between the Nubian motherhood the concept I've just explained to you, and what they call it in the West, feminism. In the Nubian model, as we went through it, with the definition of aid, women ascendancy through the culture, by default. The culture just accept women because they look at it as a mother. In the other way, women ascendancy all because uh, the community is a man-biased community, it's a patriarchal community, and it's divided between men and women. By the way, we have a gender list. Here we have a gender community. Masculine, again, it's feminine. And then they have fight, and then women have to gain their will, their rights through fight and struggle. Because the culture is not accepting. The mother is a source of moral in this model. And... Uh, and not only the source of moral, the holiness, the source of divine nature. And here, we have to call for gender equality <laughs> on, on growth. And the women have to fight for liberation and independence and, and against all forms of tyranny. And women have to fight for empowerment. And here, all of the women have its own source of power. This is the Kandaka. Again, it's one, I think this is Betty Friedian, or mm -hmm. one of the American feminists in the 60s. Uh, they call it the second wave of feminism. Right. <laughs> so, you already, they think this is the, this is the last model of modernism. Mm -hmm. You guys, you already, your ancestors, African, mm -hmm. have already, have given this, like, right. thousand years ago. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm very sorry, again, I am really... Honored to be in Molefe Asante, and I consider myself a student and a, and a disciple. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, very powerful, so many ideas, so much to consider. I mean, it's really, really powerful. Thank you, Brother Newman, who, Newman too. That is very, very, very wonderful. Now, I know that there are probably, I don't know whether there are any questions online, but certainly there are uh, some people who would have some comments. I would like to take the opportunity to, to just uh, say that, uh, you know, I, I'm sitting there feeling like, wow, this is information that uh, we all need, and we need to just spread this information. I remember when I was uh, in school, as uh, Nana Okru Asante Piazza, uh, Chidomhini of Tafo, and Achim, Ghana, one of the things that occurred to me was just this notion of the power of the, uh, uh, the, the mother, but just the power also of the, the role of the woman. Because um, it's very, very strange that the Europeans didn't understand that. And I don't think the Arabs understood it in Sudan either. Uh, and that is this, that uh, when the Europeans saw in West Africa, uh, the woman who was the one who selected, for example, the king, uh, they didn't know what to call her because she was, in, in the case of the Asante, the Akan people, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the woman who had this power was not necessarily the wife of the king. Uh, and so they didn't know what to call it because in Europe you would say the queen because the queen would be married to the king. But in the case of the Akan, the, they didn't know what to do with this woman who had this power 
to, to rule and to do things for the people and the nation and to select the king. So they call a queen mother. And when I, th when I think of that, it says to me that this concept that Brother Newbin to has uh, introduced many of us to for the first time is such an enduring concept in the African world. You go throughout the African world and you see the same thing. You even look at Shaka, uh, the great martial leader, military genius, that they always try to say he was this and that and that. Well, he was no more uh, 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 immoral than Napoleon or Hitler or Putin or anybody else you name who was in war. He was a warrior. He was a fighter. That's for sure. He killed people. So, but his mother was his greatest source. So I look at this notion of the maternal, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the maternalistic uh, aspect of African culture. And I think that when the Arabs came into Africa, that was one of the things that they used against us. And that's what you were saying, that they didn't realize that the Nubian who were ruling felt like, well, you know, they've taken, they've taken God's wife of Amman. They've taken God. You can't do that because we need that sacred power and that sacred energy from the women, you see? So woman was more powerful, and that's why Nubia had more queens or rulers, I should say. They had more women rulers than any ancient civilization you can name. Right there in Nubia. More, more rulers. You can hardly name one ruler. You certainly can't name five rulers of Greece who were women. You know what I'm saying? Or Rome. But, but in Nubia, you, you have them. Even to the last great one, the Manorinus who fought the Romans to a standstill, you see? So many, many, many things. I, I mean, I was very inspired, Brother Newman, too, uh, by your, uh, your uh, uh, erudition, uh, your, uh, your understanding of African culture and African values. I just want to make one comment, though, and that's about pre-colonial. I don't think that we should necessarily use the colonial period in any part of Africa as a marker for our hi history. In other words, let's forget them. They're footnotes. They're not a major force. This is, our history is thousands of years old. So don't let's, I don't even use, I don't even like talking about post-colonial, pre-colonial. No, 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 no. We struggled against these people. We fought against them after thousands of years. And in some cases, they may have ruled for a thousand years. They may have ruled, in some cases, less than 90 years, as in some cases, and still call themselves colonies. So, so we used to talk about the period of resistance. And that's what I talk about when I talk about African history. I talk about those periods when you have intrusions and invasions. There are no people in Africa who's not uh, practicing African culture uh, that you could not call, if, they, if they're not practicing the African culture and African values and they're not based on that, they must be invaders or the sons and the daughters of invaders. Because African culture has its particularities and there are certain aspects of our culture that are so deeply rooted in the, uh, in the African culture that we need to, we can talk about, instead of pre-colonial, we talk about uh, authentic African studies. That's what we call it, rather than pre-colonial African studies. Authentic African cultures. You go back to that. So that, that must be a comment. Oh, uh, uh, wow, well, okay, brother. This brother here has a comment. You want to come to the microphone. Right. So they can hear you on YouTube. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I would say I got two names. I'm from Sudan. I'm from Darfur, and I'm a student at Temple University at the Department of African American Studies. So, with regard with the um, the point that I want to make is a comment more than um, just uh, 
uh, a question. Um, I, I look at the endangered language that you talk about, and the languages in linguistic, uh, they are source of development of any, of any society. So my example of South Africa, and uh, they have 11 um, languages that are official languages in the country. And out of that 11 languages, the nine are African languages, which are the languages of knowledge production, not only just the communication. They use it in universities, in every domain, in every uh, public institution. So African languages viewed as the resources for human advancement and the growth. That's the one thing in, in, in regarding other African mm -hmm. experience that I had. With regard to Sudan, if you talk about endangered languages, then you, you gotta talk about the general idea of imposition of Arabization by, by the whole nation, not only Sudan, by whole from Saudi Arabia to Egypt to, to, um, to whole Saudi desert, because they need to impose their notion on African uh, people, and that's what happened in Sudan. Not only 50, 1956, and then you come down, you go to go beyond that, and then you gotta connect the language and power, and the language and culture, and the language and the geology, so that we can manage to clearly talk about the endangered languages. Because I know in Sudan, in Darfur, for example, we have been told that, um, not told only, but imposed not to speak our languages in public places. And the same example happened in, in, in North, in Nubia Mountain, in South Sudan, and the South, simply they said, we don't need to be part of Sudan, because they need to redesign us in a new image, in a new identity, in a new way of looking, and thus they said, better be our own country to be who we are. That's the imposition that's happening. But languages, as I, I, I focus, and that's my focus area, I usually look at the resources for development, not just only for um, communication. And to challenge that, then you gotta challenge the, the power in, in, in Sudan, in general. And the power in, in, in whole uh, um, ideology, like Arabization is not started in Sudan. It's an ideology that has been imposed by whole Gulf is uh, providing resources that are necessarily for regenerating people in a new image. That's my comment. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right, okay. Anybody else got a comment? Yes, all right. Got a question. presentation was very well done. Um, you mentioned how diverse we are as African people, and so there's different cultures within um, our Africanness. What would you suggest as far as language, since we are so very diverse, as far as uh, university um, language for a college? What would be like your top two or three languages that you would suggest that a university starts off with African language, authentic African language. Thank you. Uh, I think this is one of the hardest questions I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the concept of uh, of uh, diversity in Africa. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Thank you very much, sister, for your questions. Uh, the concept of diversity in Africa is also associated with the concept of multiculturalism. It's embedded multicultural societies. So when I think of uh, the case of ethnocentric or uh, a centralized uh, language for, for study or for education, we're going back to the Western model. So what is the problem if we can have a platform of diversity and uh, allow the community to select, not allowing the institute to impose, no, let the people because that what happens. I'm sure there was sometimes that some languages was kind of more common in Africa than others. But this come from the selection within our own form of democracy. Mm -hmm. 
not imposed by institutions because this will corrupt everything and goes back to the hierarchy and we are dismantling the hierarchies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Okay, there, there was a question on YouTube as to whether or not you had any recommendations. Uh, but you have a book. What's the title of your book that they could, they could read or ask for? How could they get your, one of your, some of your writings? What's it's actually you? this this specific uh, topic be published uh, under the name of Science of Maternalism. It's a paper, academic paper. Good. Uh, Science of Maternalism. Uh, in Nobin language. All right. So how so do they get it? It's, it's I think you just Google it, Google. and then Excellent. it's free. You can download it. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I just want to. Uh, uh, okay. There's another comment. All right. Go right ahead. Yeah. Please. So they can see you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Molofi Santi, and we are just privileged to be here as well too. And uh, thank you, Luban too. That was truly, truly. Uh, excellent presentation and we definitely need you guys to step up and keep doing it and keep doing it until your voice will be heard. The, wo the world should know the African language is not coming even in Google. That is not accepted. The first human being in the earth and our language is not coming up. That's not make sense especially for today's generation. And I'm so glad we have some of you know those young kids because we are moving to giving them the, the, the poll, you know, the history, if we're not bringing them here also to listen to those all this. So how we, how we can move? If to, tomorrow there is no longer me, to do, tomorrow no longer move on to, who is going to carry up the vision and the mission? So we definitely are grateful for what you're doing and just keep peace doing. So my question is regarding to the power of the king and the queen and, and, and the, the, the uh, Kandak. The power of the Kandak has been no longer. So how, what we can do to bring that power back? Thank you very much, sister. Uh, for your comments and for your question. I think uh, this, uh, this question opens a whole challenge, uh, not on the personal level, but for the community level. Because we all are asked to bring back ourselves, uh, to restore back our, ourselves through our own vision. So yes, the Kandaka can come back and everything can come back. If we can uh, go back again to our authenticity, uh, not the colonial, to, to break all this colonial power and bondages and go back again. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So, uh, we have had uh, a wonderful presentation. I want to thank uh, our brother so much for uh, his incredible presentation. You, uh, there are many, many ideas that will be with us for a long time. And uh, just two comments. Uh, one is that the, uh, the rise of patriarchy uh, with the colonial intrusion into Africa uh, was one of the things that came both with uh, Christianity and with Islam. Both of them were patriarchal religions that, number one, imposed on African culture, which was a maternal culture, uh, this notion of patriarchy that we know. So, so that's one of the things that we need to remember. The other is in terms of language. Uh, when I was chair of the Department of Africology, at Temple University, one of the most difficult things to do, I'm so happy I'm, I can say this now, I'm free, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you're, you're free, you feel real good. Uh, was that we had struggles with the dean of the College of Liberal Arts all the time about language. It was about African language, but not African languages. We want to propose a course 
in African language to say no. Whatever. We want to, we say, look, uh, uh, Igbo is one of the big languages of Africa. Uh, can we have Igbo? No. Uh, Zulu is one of the great languages of Africa. Can we have Zulu? No. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, years ago, uh, when I had started the uh, PhD program at Temple University, we had been able to get two courses, Yoruba and Hausa. But over the years, what we have seen is that we need uh, Kiswahili. Uh, there are many students who now are very, very much interested in Baluba. There are many, many languages in Africa. That's what we were saying. But when you are in uh, an institution that promotes uh, white racial domination, these are not of interest to them. And we have to provoke, agitate, fight, struggle, assert every day. Wherever you are as an African person, you must fight for the African languages. And you must always do that. Because that's why we, when we start talking about development, and it's true, uh, Brother Tugu mentioned South Africa. I spoke for the uh, government of South Africa about four years ago at their conference on African languages. Because they have these 11 languages, but what the South African government has done is promote those languages, all those languages. Every African language is important. And we need to promote them. We need to have contests in Nubin. We need to have all kinds of things so that we continue to develop our languages. Those who have colonized Africa, those who have the hegemony on African people and African cultures have tried to downplay our languages in order to rule over us with their concepts and ideas. So, mm -hmm. brother, you have just given us a powerful presentation. I have, you know, I made a mistake. I told you the next lecture is the 26th. But it can't be the 26th, because that's a Tuesday. <laughs> the next lecture uh, at the Malefi Kete Asante Institute for the lecture series that you are now on, on YouTube, will be on July the 24th. And on July the 24th will be Dr. Kimani Nehusi. We want to once again thank Brother Nubentud Khalil for a very provocative lecture. Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you. All right, we call upon our ancestors far and near, uh, mother of our mothers and father of our fathers, to always render mercy and to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people. Ashe. Thank you so much.